the topics of human evolution, ethics, and open source mapping. And if you think that sounds like an ambitious topic, um, that is because it is. But we do have an hour and 20 minutes for it. Uh, and my name, uh, Moritz, Moritz van der Vlucht, I'll be your moderator uh, for today. Um, joining us um, on the panel, we have from left to right, Saren Eagleson, um, Adam Steer, and Hannah, Hannah Dormido. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce them to you, but after that, we're really looking forward uh, to quite an engaged discussion uh, and some participation from you as well. Um, and as you can see on the screen behind us, um, we will be doing some live polling on some of the questions uh, that we're putting out to you as a way to get that conversation going. So if you um, get your devices ready uh, and maybe follow one of those URLs and we will be putting out the polls um, question by question as we go along while our own open source Anthony Green back here, Alex, <laughs> uh, will analyze the lumber numbers and call the results. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but um, let's quickly um, introduce our panelists, um, Saren, Dr. Cyril Eagleson. Her expertise lies in spatial data infrastructures and developing strategies for the improved use of spatial information. Prior to taking up her current role as manager of university partnerships at Data61, Saren was deputy director of the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network, better known as ORIN, and assistant director of research of Frontier SI. She has a PhD from the University of Melbourne, specializing in the design of administrative boundaries for spatial analysis. Let's welcome Saren. <laughs> then our next panelist is uh, Dr. Adam Steer. Uh, he defines himself as a serial multidisciplinarian. Um, with career highlights in Antarctic logistics, sea ice field research, and massive high resolution geospatial data management. The intersection of technology and human evolution is a key driver in Adam's outlook. How do we use all this to become better humans? How to uh, imagine a better placed person to participate in our panel? Thank you very much, Adam. Um, last but not least. Some of you may already have seen Hannah's presentation before. Um, earlier today, um, she's a data visual journalist at Bloomberg News, where she covers global politics, economics, and science and technologies from the company's Asia headquarters in Hong Kong. Prior to joining Bloomberg, Ms. Domito led the editorial graphics team for the Financial Times in Asia as senior editor. Before specializing in graphics and data visualization, Hannah worked as a writer, reporter, and producer. She sees herself as a full-time journalist, part-time mermaid, and a QGIS sorceress in training. Now, now in your program, you may have seen that we actually originally had planned to have four uh, panelists. Unfortunately, our fourth panelist, Edwin Liava, um, could not get his visa to travel to Australia, uh, and therefore had to uh, cancel at the last minute. Um, he will be missed. Um, so what are we doing today? Um, we want to get the panel and the audience to engage um, in a bold exploration of how an open geospatial community can become the foundation for an equitable, sustainable and world, one that we are happy to hand over to the future. We all like to live, leave our planet and society in just a slightly better state uh, than when we turned up on it. And the question is, how can the open geospatial community contribute to that goal? Some people argue that this by necessity includes a deep embrace of diversity and inclusion. They say it must also consider the sustainability of racing to technical solutions and ethical questions such as privacy. Fundamentally, the free and open source and open data communities that we're representing do more than just help out cash trap departments or make us feel nice. Um, and it's not just about being free. It's about creating a system where our nat naturally altruistic instincts can thrive. It helps us communicate ideas that are social, political, and geopolitical constructs that can act as barriers. It helps us become better new humans, 
or does it? Paul Ramsey, this morning in his opening keynote, introduced the three economics, economies that impact and drive the open community, the attention, gift, and cash economies. Within that context, where do ethics, altruism, and diversity fit in? Do they apply to and impact all three of these economies? So these are just some questions um, that we hope to discuss. Um, I'd like to now open up um, to um, our panelists and get them to give you their views in about five minutes about what matters in this field and hopefully give you something to think about. Karen, Sarah. Great, thanks, Marit. Is this on? Uh, Mark? Can you hear it back? Anthony. <laughs> it's on? Okay, just need to speak up. All right, well, thank you very much, Maritz, for introducing our topic. I must say that when I was asked to be on the, the panel, I got a little shiver when we talk about um, ethics. Um, and I think that's natural because it's where, where do you draw the line um, sometimes. So I was recently tested and the, the speaker walked in and said, OK, so we assume that everyone here is a law-abiding citizen. <laughs> and we make that natural assumption of our community. And then he asked the question, so who's ever broken the speed limit. Yeah, okay, <laughs> quite a few hands go up. So you know what the speed limit is, and yet you just go that little bit extra because, well, you've evaluated the risk and there doesn't appear to be any at the time. Um, and that's, I guess, sort of how I see um, open data in some ways. So I've spent a lot of time working for Oren in um, championing open data, trying to get uh, departments to open their data, um, overcoming barriers. So a lot of people will tell you, oh, it's just too hard, it's not my job. Actually, I'm embarrassed of the state of my data. Um, and, it, you know, you sort of go through this and, and you go through it for, for years, actually. <laughs> and then finally you get the data, um, you give it to someone in the research on the open source community, they use the analytics and they do something great with it and then you're able to take it back and show that person or that organisation, wow, look what we can do. And um, we saw that this morning uh, in a number of presentations that I attended. So um, I think that we, we do have a role to play um, and we're doing it doing a great job because we've come a long way uh, especially over the last 10 years where I've been involved in um, I guess championing the open data but I do see that there are those situations where I get a little squeamish when um, we're looking at health data and thinking about well if we put X with Y with Z and then you know you can identify someone uh, or, or something um, particularly with new technology, behavioural patterns. Um, uh, uh, one we're, we're grappling with in our household is, um, would we put a tracker on our child? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'd like to know where they are, but then, well, what if other people know where they are? Um, you know, where do we draw the line? Uh, so they're just some of the, I guess, random thoughts that I had coming into this discussion. Um, but the other one, I think, is around leadership. And we've seen amazing leaders speaking throughout the day and, we'll, and tomorrow, and the organisers have put the event uh, together. So I think this is a great forum to have the conversation um, and to see what we can truly do when we work together. Thank you, Sarah. Adam. So um, I have to out myself as the originator of this topic. It was <laughs> I, I proposed it to the committee, and, and then it got up, and I was like, okay, now I probably have to say something about it. <laughs> but um, I guess the the topic originated from a random conversation with a guy who works for the Department of Defense, and he asserted that mapping is a fundamental need of humans. It doesn't matter, you know, where you come from. It's it's one of those things that we need to do. We need to navigate to get places, and we've seen that today. We've seen um, um, I sat in a talk this morning about reimagining OpenStreetMap for Indigenous people and groups um, in ways that, that we don't see as important in terms of roads and buildings. What else out there can we map? But the point there is that, that mapping and navigation comes from all over the place. It's not something that we developed in, in the technological West. It's something we've always done and it's fundamental to being human. So I guess from there, looking into the, the open source community, um, again, it's, it's more than just about being able to map stuff for free or 
or you know, let people do stuff for, for not much money. It's about building a community um, that can create a really representative map of the world from a lot of different inputs. And I guess we've all seen, as soon as you start sort of narrowing your view on the world, you start running into problems because unexpected things pop up that you, you, know, you didn't think about. And you can only see so far at once. And I have, I have a, a, you know, admittedly a pretty narrow view on the world. I come from a, a very incredibly privileged part of the planet and, and um, part of society. I have very few sort of real obstacles in, in terms of career or whatever I want to do. And I can take advantage of that. And, but, and that's easy to do. But if I sort of carry on down that path and never look aside from it, then I, I am doing myself a disservice by um, you know, missing half of the world and how it operates. And I think the, um, the powerful thing about this community is that you can break down that barrier and it's very easy to sort of look around and see different views and have different people come and contribute. Um, and in my sort of relatively short compared to a bunch of people here, geospatial career, I've seen, had the privilege, I guess, of seeing that happen. Like I, I was in Dar es Salaam earlier this year and that was um, quite an incredible event, not just because um, these conferences are really awesome and amazing, but because you could look around in the room and see that what we do in the open source community makes real difference to people's lives. So fundamental things, like not, not being able to just go around the corner and find the nearest coffee shop, but find a place where you can be safe or a place where you can find shelter. And these things are just things that we take for granted. But this open source community that, that we've built, or that, that many, many people have built, um, makes real differences to those, those people's lives in ways that we don't even think about. And um, I guess that was the, the spark that drove the, the topic that we've got today. And I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks about it, because um, you know, I have my views, but I'd love to have them challenged and see what everyone else thinks as well. Thank you, Adam. Hannah, your views. So I'm coming at this from a non-GIS background, and a few other things. I grew up in a third world country in the Philippines, but I'm now based in Hong Kong. I am female, and I am a journalist with no clue of what Shapefile was, or <laughs> KML was, or you know co what coordinates were. So it's quite intimidating for someone like me to step inside a room where um, people know these things quite well. It's like, I'm going to pretend I know what I'm talking about and just stand here in front of you or sit in front of you. But um, so I think I'm, I'm coming from the diversity perspective. It's more of what I like about this venue is that I am not intimidated to share what I think. And I feel like this is a good um, venue for someone with a background like mine to actually share like where I'm coming from. So I have journalistic training for those who were there during um, the presentation. I just learned um, GIS, I think, five, seven years ago because I needed to. I specialized from doing beat reporting to editing stories for the web, producing for TV, <laughs> to actually creating data visualization. And that entailed me learning to make maps. And before we would trace maps, so we had SVGs, take a screenshot of Google Earth and try to like squeeze them all together. And oh, maybe it's here. It's here. And mm -hmm. that's what we put on our um, newspapers, just because ArcGIS was very expensive. So the newsrooms would do that, um, except maybe for the very fancy ones. Until QGIS was rolled out as open source, and our, an, our editor in London then for the newspaper it was working for said, oh, we're going to start using QGIS. <laughs> like, what the hell is that? Um, <laughs> but they sent, out, um, they sent out links of YouTube videos for us to learn from. So I'm basically self-taught. Everything GIS I had to Google. <laughs> Uh, I had to buy books um, to learn. So, and this is my second um, open source conference. And the first one, I was a bit more intimidated. And I'm quite happy to see more women here 
and people of color. It's, it might not be much for some, but for someone like me to come to a place where I can see people look like me, um, it's quite empowering. It's, it's a very empowering thing that um, if you grew up probably in a first world country or, I don't know, in a middle class background, that's something you might overlook because that's something you don't, I don't know, just pay attention to. But for someone like a female of color, growing up in a third world country, being able to sit here and like talk to people and learn from everyone, um, it's quite empowering. So that's what open source has allowed. And I hope it continues to allow that. It's like, let people from the fringes in and empower us to speak up, to learn more, and hope that people who come from more empowered backgrounds actually learn from us too. Thank you very much uh, from our panelists. Quite a, a wide range of views and, and sort of starting positions. Um, anyone like to ask our panelists a question, make a comment? We have a roving microphone somewhere. We yep, we do. All right. Um, at this point, um, are we all in violent agreement with what they're saying? Or is it all balderdash? Jonah here up front. There was some controversy in uh, September when Linus Torvalds had to step down, and he said that he stepped down because he was not being a very good uh, uh, leader of uh, the Linux kernel. He wasn't treating people very well. He was being a gatekeeper, and he was being very rude about it. Um, there is this idea that open source is democratic. It's not democratic. There are gatekeepers. Is that a problem? I'm not sure if that's a problem. Uh, who would like to uh, <laughs> tackle that? So I come from a background where gatekeeping is important. Um, but I'm quite new to open source, so I might be just imposing what I know to the community. But um, I think a certain level of gatekeeping is important. I'm not sure what is happening right now, generally, in in the community, but I feel like there are standards that need to be met. And because I think we're continuously growing, and that's never going to stop. And we have to ensure that that growth is quality, is of quality as well, and the standards are kept at, um, at a certain level. I'm not sure what kind of gatekeeping that would be. I'm not sure what the, the hierarchy looks like now, but I feel like gatekeeping entirely is not bad. But it has to be implemented in such a way that the community benefits from it, and it doesn't hinder growth. Yeah, you like comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the the history of Linus Torvalds, but I think um, as much as he's he's been renowned for being fairly aggressive or assertive in or not being a very not being a really nice guy when it comes to personal disagreements about how the community operates, um, probably like everybody learns and evolves at some point, and in one way it's, it's great to see someone just going, well, I've, I need to change and, and take that on and actually do it. So, um, yeah, I agree that, that we need a certain standard, but there's many ways to not be aggressive about asserting it or, or do it in a way that's encouraging and helps to lift people up rather than sort of squash people down and say... And um, that's... In, in my exposure to the people that I interact with in the community, people are extremely generous and helpful, and it's it's an interaction between you and the. I, I'm not a code writer. I'm a user, and occasionally chip in with documentation, and running workshops and exposing. I, I operate in the attention economy, um, to take from Paul's talk. So, doing that, it's 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 always being a bit conscious about how much it's, it goes both ways. You, as a user, you need to be conscious about how much you're asking of volunteers. And as a developer or, or a gatekeeper, it's important to be conscious of a lot of people are just going to ask new questions and probably not know the ropes so well and try to help them get on the ropes and get, get going, so to speak. Thank you. I don't know the situation, but obviously leadership is really important and having somebody at least acknowledge where they've gone wrong um, 
and we can all grow from that. Thank you. Over there, go. Can I just say, I'm sure that there must be other people in this, it's okay, let it go. Other people in this community who belong to Facebook groups where the role of moderator actually comes into play here. I don't really like this term gatekeeper, but I guess it's common in some working environments. But I think if you think back to uh, Wikipedia, which supposedly is moderated by its whole community, because anybody can then correct it, and a moderator on a Facebook site is more likely to have specialist knowledge in that area, I think what we need is moderation, and maybe um, we're using the wrong term when we describe a gatekeeper as closing access. Um, it, it's just... Um, another way of saying, can we have this discussion in another context, okay? Because yep. I, I, I'm very new in this world and I value the fact that there are people who have been in this world for a long time who are willing to continue to work to keep it as open as they can, respecting the fact that there will be people who are participating, like myself, with little experience. So. We, I think we need somebody there. I just don't like the term gatekeeper because it implies a security aspect that I don't think we need. And I just like, prefer the term moderate. Okay? Hey, everybody's nodding. Yeah. Good, that was a great point. Thank you very much. Um, over here. Um, <clears throat> from, from the sort of planet and he human evolution, it seems to me that um, I'm just wondering how, whether open sort of mapping it especially isn't a wonderful tool for starting to widen out our concept of human consciousness and diversity mm -hmm. and learn to use it better. There's something about a database from a different perspective from Google's, which for me sort of lights up the possibility that other people could dive in and see the world differently and that that might be a learning experience for everyone. Does anyone have any comment? Because we don't use diversity we're very well. We're a bit inclined to compete and gatekeep. Yeah. I mean, I'd just comment and say I agree. I think we're evolving uh, to understand culture and to do it in a sensitive way. So I know from my experience working at Oren, we, we sort of shied away from um, exposing maps, of, I mean, Indigenous maps, for example, because I know that culture is see their maps in very different ways to what we do and we just hadn't done that piece yet but um, going to your presentation today um, I can say there's a lot of um, opportunity there for us to evolve the way we think uh, you know, and portray spatial information especially with um, new, new techniques and communities developing new visualisation uh, techniques so a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I was at your talk this morning as well, and, and I, I found it fascinating. And again, it's it's you know being being a white person on a continent that's basically been occupied by, by other people that I know little about for sixty five thousand years. I can't you know ethically stand up and say I'm going to make a map of Aboriginal Australia. It's got to be something that's left to the people that understand it. And I, I would love to see it happen for one. And I would love for my kids to see it happen and grow up with a much better understanding than I grow up with. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, one last question in the back. Thank you. Um, we had a presentation earlier this afternoon about uh, the work that's been done in New Zealand with their building outlines data um, led by Land Information New Zealand. We have a very different situation, obviously, here in Australia, where we do have a, a, a buildings outline data set that's recently been created, but it's not been made available openly. Um, so uh, I guess maybe playing on the topic of, of the panel session, I'd, I'd like to ask the panel what their thoughts are about government evolution, ethics, and open source mapping. <laughs> Love you. I mean, I've been knocking on those doors to get the data set open. Um, I mean, and we've come some way, but I think there's some amazing uh, techniques happening through the open source community. Um, I'm not sure if Felix Lipkin's still here, but um, he's been developing tools to, to automate the feature extraction of building outlines. So I'd say we're not that far away. Um, 
And I mean, we're experiencing it now, Jonathan, through the open street maps being as good as um, some of the authoritative government data sets. So, yeah, yeah, better. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, it's the time for government to say, well, how are we going to in integrate here? And, um, you know, do they really have the authoritative stamp that it once had? Um, so, yeah, I mean, from the conversations I see, we're, we're not that far away. Anyone else like to comment? I'm more of from the user end, I think, who's trying to access these data sets as well. Um, I've seen Australia has been quite good about putting up these files there compared to other parts of the world. Um, we used to trace them as well, which might not sound, well, it is difficult. So it's, I think there is an, a lack of appreciation from some governments of why there is a need to do this. Um, it's also, I think, a concern could be security, because there are countries that I know wouldn't give you the exact locations of places. I'm not going to name the country, because I might not be able to come back. Um, but I know that Google Maps is a few inches off, so you're not if you overlay OpenStreetMaps and Google Maps, which I have done for stories, um, some of the roads are off. Some of the, yeah, the rivers are off as well. So I, there are, I, I believe there are countries that are never going to do that. Um, I feel it's more of their belief, you know, that people are going to use this against their national security. But from my point of view as a mapper and as the journalist, I think it is quite important because there are so much um, things that you can learn from um, all of this. And there are so much data that you can overlay to do analysis, but there that you can never find, or it's tough to find shape files or stuff for this, except OpenStreetMap. Thank you. Just wanted to, to have a quick riff on the topic of government evolution and um, point out an example that, that actually works. Um, Geo, Geoscience Australia has their um, Digital Earth Australia project and that's an example of the reverse. They're just giving a data away that historically small enterprises have gone, that's, that's our little play area and we generate that and sell it. And then um, GA have come along and go, we're just going to make this as a national product and give it away. So that's, that's kind of, and that's been driven a lot by people who are intensely interested in, and there are some of the people who are in this room, but intensely interested in, in open source systems and um, being able to do something awesome with, with this ecosystem of software and data and produce something that's valuable to everybody. Uh, there's a lady with a hand up in the back. We're going to take one question there, and then we're going to go to our first poll question, and we're going to take it from there. Thank you. Um, just a quick question regarding um, for those of for those of us who work in developing countries, uh, are from developing countries. What's your view, opinion? Is there a place where um, for Pacific Islanders, is there a place where we a hub where we can always um, reach out to to get materials where we can. Um, get the locals or the Pacific Islanders involved into this because we've seen Pacific Islanders participate in such um, conference. Uh, it's the going back bit and making sure that it's integrated with the local users, with the government users. That's where the communication is lacking. So I wonder what's your thought on that or if there's anything done in that regards. Any thoughts on taking learnings from an event like this back to your own community? That, that was your question? Uh, not only that, if, if there is a hub where we can reach out to to get some sort of um, direction um, on where we can actually facilitate our local users and say these are the you know, sample, uh, these are the things that we can so, do to help support you. So you can things continue like the conversation and not have to wait till the next FOS4G conference? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, anyone got any experience or pointers or anyone else in the, um, in the room want to answer a question? If... I think that's probably an area where 
um, Osteo can probably needs to step up a little more. Um, but it has to be a two-way process of actually saying what it is that you need in, in probably fairly concrete terms. Um, and then Osteo can jump into action, I think, um, to, to help facilitate that. Um, anyway, I'm happy to chat about it afterwards. OK. Thank you. Um, I'd like now to take uh, um, to our first uh, poll question, um, Anthony. Um, so everybody, grab your phones out and make sure you've got this link. Does anybody need more time to put it in? Anybody slack? <laughs> it's not the 90s anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, while, while you're doing that, it's either of those, so they go to the same... Yeah, they go to the same one. Same word, right? so they're both equally, lang equally long and complicated. Um, <laughs> um, All right, so the well, question is open now, the first question. So you should see it if you've got the web page open. Yeah, and if you're still working on that, the question? <laughs> um, a few people do, by the sound of it. Yep. So the question is, do you have to be a latte-sipping, left-wing, greeny snowflake hipster to genuinely contribute to the open source, open data, or open government community? Um, <laughs> Um, and um, the poll is full and no longer accepting responses. What do you mean poll is full? There you go. It just reached the maximum responses. That's what we get for doing it live, hey? <laughs> they say vote, vote early and vote often, right? While we, while we, while we um, update our technology, I think um, the early exit polls results show a strong trend here. Um, <laughs> Which is not entirely surprising, um, but <laughs> but it but it and, and then maybe it's one that we we need to start um, exporting a little bit outside of our community because I I suspect that people who don't feel part of this particular community might feel excluded because of that perception. Um, which may be the reason that whoever put this post question together, um, that they put it there. Um, how are we going? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just paying for the software. <laughs> paying for the software. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very good. We'll, 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 we'll pass the hat. We'll, we'll, uh, we, 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 I mean, John's paying. We, we, um, <laughs> We will pass the head around in a, in a minute. Um, in the meantime, um, I don't think we had a chance to look at the, the result, but it seemed there was an initial overwhelming trend towards, no, we need diversity uh, ourselves. Um, and I guess it already you know, um, touched upon in your earlier answers, but someone liked it. All right, to... try again. <laughs> <laughs> this is your chance to now sabotage the results. So there we go. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. So while while there is clearly a majority of things now we, we need diversity, um, there's also over a third of people here who think, well, it certainly helps. Um, so does anyone here think that it certainly helps and, and why? <laughs> Anyone would like to comment? Leandro. This is a question. Where do people go when they want? Sorry, wait for, can you wait for the microphone, please? Where do people usually go when they want help? As far as... I'm a coder, so I go to Stack Overflow, usually. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, one question I always want to ask is, has anybody got this data, or where do I find this data, especially for open data? Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't always seem to be the right forum because it's a coding software thing. Mm -hmm. Do we have any sort of forums where people can ask questions like that? Or what sh sort of software should I use for this? I see two hands over there, Steve, and then the gentleman in the middle. We'll get the panel to answer some questions later. Hi. There is also a, um, a sister site to Stack Overflow called opendata.stackexchange.com, which is full of questions about where can I get this uh, open data set that I want, and full of no responses. 
Uh, yep, uh, yes there is. They're called librarians. They've been around for a little while. Uh, I myself am a librarian and I deal in maps for the university. So if anybody in the university has a query, they come to me for data questions. And I lecture on that as well. Where do you get the data? <laughs> All over the place. <laughs> Um, as a moderator, I'm not a gatekeeper, I now decree that you can only speak if you have a microphone in your hand. I do have a microphone. <laughs> um, I was also going to mention if you're into that sort of thing, there are a couple of um, Slack communities that are, that are pretty good for geospatial stuff. There's the, um, the spatial community and um, there's also our Map Time Australia Slack community, which I think we might want to raise out to like Map Time Oceania or something, because we certainly are using it more widely. Do we, for this conference, have a place where people can post links? Is it either or with the Twitter? Twitter with the hashtag. So can you please post links to whatever it is that you suggest? I'm, I'm not much of a Twitterer, but someone's. The I'm sure there's someone sitting within, within your sphere of influence who can do help you with that. Matt. Um, I was just going to say, just to answer that question, um, and surprisingly I haven't seen any or heard any mention, um, but um, ODI Australian, uh, Open Data Institute, um, have a website that lists well over, well, I'm thinking 5,000, oh no, there we go, 2,600 open data portals. Um, the great thing about one-stop shops is there's so many to choose from. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to, I'll give a plug for, for Orin and their open API in Australia and also um, national map with the range of the national data sets. Yeah. Gentlemen in back. Yeah. Well, I think the trouble is that most data sets are not open. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge amount of data that I use that I can't give out because it isn't open. And one of the reasons this is happening is we now have laws to say that you can only use data for the purpose it was collected. And for us, that's absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? The whole point of GIS is that we overlay data sets that were collected for other purposes mm -hmm. and come up with new conclusions and new maps. Uh, if we're limited to only the purpose that was collected, there wouldn't be many data sets at all, would there? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'd, I'd like to take this back to the panel um, and, and ask if you, that's something you experience as well, um, or whether you see that as, while there are still many data sets that are still closed, there could actually be a trend where we see now, for instance, the Queensland government made all its spatial data available under uh, Creative Commons. Um, any, any trends um, you see, you want to observe or comments you want to make on that? Maybe it's just more of finding the data that is open. So there's a Google Data Explorer that they recently launched. Um, sorry, Google Public Data Explorer that it will help you pull um, data that's out there for your stories. The problem would be what data is out there or if it's out there. But if you don't know where to start, maybe that would be a good platform to just search whatever is out there. But we're not sure what's out there. Yes, um, I want to touch on your question and the question about getting data from Pacific Islands and also on evolution of governments. It's a, there's a sort of neat triangle there. I've tried to get a hold of data sets from Pacific Island states before. And it's not easy, like, um, for instance, if I, I work on point cloud data and LiDAR, and if I want something over New South Wales, I can just go and get it. If I want something from a Pacific island, I know the data is there, I know who has it, and I go to talk to them, and it's like, no, you can't have it. Um, and the response is usually, I'm not sure why we can't have it, we, you just can't. Um, so that might be one of the issues surrounding not being able to get data from East Timor, but you should also talk to the, the man sitting next to you. He's got a lot of experience in, in 
be maybe able to help you out more than I can there. Yeah. But um, I mean, collecting collecting data is one thing, and then it does. You know, making open data isn't just like a an act of of giving away stuff. It's also a very political um, negotiation. Like some governments will say, "Oh, we can make money out of this," or you know, as, as Hannah was saying, "We don't want people to know where stuff is." Um, probably also not realizing that there's many ways to circumvent that system and know where stuff is anyway. You can just go and buy imagery from Planet, um, unless you're in the US. But um, and then getting data that's collected for a purpose and not being able to recycle it for other purposes. That, uh, the only cases I've seen that happen is collecting personal data, in which case I think it's a really good idea. Because um, I think, as Saren was saying, it's increasingly easy to um, accidentally identify people. So for instance, if you're thinking about tracking phone data, for instance, you might have de-identified data. And that's, that's OK. You can sort of figure out where people went. But you know, if you're looking around at de-identified phone data and you know, a 44-year-old person that you know they're 44 years old, you don't know who they are, and they walk into a record shop or walk into a shop and buy something, and there's only one of them that goes and does that per day, it's very easy to find out who they are. So it's, for that purpose, I, I think that's a really good idea. I haven't seen that sort of ruling applied to geospatial or other geospatial data, like um, or other geospatial data that I've worked with anyway. Thanks. Sarah? Uh, I, I think Australia's doing a good job, but it's slow. So we had the Productivity Commission inquiry and there was an overwhelming um, number of responses um, and they put out the issues paper. We've now had the establishment of the Office of the National Data Custodian. Um, we're yet to see what um, sort of teeth they have. They've had an issues paper. Uh, we responded that to that um, from an RM perspective, saying, you know, if the data is um, not, not about people, so go back to the building footprints, um, open space, I mean, then these data sets absolutely should be, should be made available. And we haven't had a lot of opposition to that. Um, but the wheels just seem to be going slowly. And um, yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you had a question. Yeah, I guess it's a question and comment. And I'd like to talk about the safety and privacy issues. But first up, the National Data Commission has been established. And I've been doing some work with the New South Wales Chief Data, data Scientist around data sharing and, um, and the open government movement around the uses of open data. So one of the biggest challenges is the government actually doesn't know what data we want. So my suggestion would be if you have some requests, then do um, ask, the relative, like, ask the Chief Information Officers get in contact with the National Data Commission, but the more they hear back from us about what it is that we need, then they can respond to that. Mm. How, however long it takes them to do that, <laughs> but they need to hear from us. Mm. The other thing that I would say around open data and open source is the stories around how it's being used. The government doesn't value it particularly well because they don't know how we're using it. So we need to be able to tell those stories about how we're using it a bit better and spread those around and raise awareness, I think, within the community and within the business community as well and sharing those stories. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, just talking about ethics and that point that was just made around the, um, the single purpose of data, and that's something that the Data Commission for the federal government is putting forward as a suggestion in terms of enabling data sharing. Um, and I, I think there's pros and cons. And I think it's something we should probably talk as a community about how we have that debate, particularly with government and understanding what um, our needs are, but also how do we protect the privacy of people when people things can be identified, re-identified? Yeah, I how? <laughs> I don't think that there's an, an the easy bullet? answer. There are amazing things that are happening with technology and being able to, um, you know, develop secure encryption into databases, being able to aggregate to a certain level. I mean, the ABS have been doing it for decades. Um, and so I do think that there are a lot of techniques that can be used. And I also think it's about you know, we talk about the five safes model and making sure that the people who are using the data are using it for a genuine purpose to, um, you know, advance research. If you need you need data at the scale of which you're trying to make a decision or or influence, so having highly aggregated data is 
you know, just a waste of time <laughs> in a lot of cases or, you know, introducing errors is not advancing our research and, and outcomes that we need. So we do need the people that need to get to the right scale and the right data to be able to use it and to put those those safeguards in place. I mean, I, and, and that's what the the um, Office of the National Data Custodian is uh, working towards and accreditation of units to al allow that to happen. Um, but yeah, obviously it's a tricky one and um, yeah, I, I do think that they need to hear from us and they do need to um, have some clear um, case studies or, or, or research outcomes. I know health in Western Australia, they've managed to advance their health systems and their, their research programs much further than the eastern states have been able to uh, because they had data linkages from early early on. Um, and so there, there are good models, um, but they're still not as good as some of our European um, mm. countries. So there are other countries that have made further advances. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of learnings that we can take from other places. All right, I want to take one last question before we go to the next poll question, which will be <laughs> short and ending in a question mark. Uh -huh. uh, we have been mostly talking about government data so far. Uh, but arguably, the discussion has progressed way further in access to government or public data than it has uh, with respect to data collected by large private company, um, companies such as Google, um, Facebook, um, any telecommunication company, and so on. And, and, and now this, this becomes really interesting because there is a huge level of inequality in access there. Those data are collected and they are being used but the access there is highly inequal. I mean, that's because they have to protect the data as well, but also they protect their access to a, a very rich market of knowledge about the society, right? Um, about knowing where people move, about knowing what traffic does, and, and so on and so forth. Now, how do we, I mean, these are data about us in many ways. They are our data. But for instance, researchers do not have ways to even check whether the models of traffic or, or epidemiological models and so on are correct, whether they, question, they are please? to be trusted and so on. So my question is, <laughs> what is missing uh, to convince all these private, private companies to release the data in some ways? Is it technology? Is it some kind of legal framework? Or is it some, some, something we call a social license, whether we have rights to this data? It's, it's, it's cold hard cash. They make a lot of money out of us. So they're going to keep a hold of that as long as they can and make every last cent. Um, that's, that's, that's my view on that, that particular part of the world. Um, I think it's also going to be quite tricky because if you're a user, and we usually don't read those license agreements anyway, but. Um, but if we do, do they say that if we collect your data, it will be available for public consumption? Or will it say that you know, our company is going to keep it, but we're going to sell it to marketers? So I, I'm not really sure about what we're supposed to do, but it's more of I feel it's, that's a very tricky situation. But it needs to be talked about. Um, do we need to revise how we agree to their license agreements before we sign up to the sites? so that we know what we're getting into. So if you sign up to Facebook, for example, and they tell you that you know, if you sign up now and you use it, everywhere, or everything you put up will be collected and put out into the public as open data. Like, How will the people feel about that? Um, or should they say, we will keep it pub private, but you're agreeing that the you know, research companies that can pay for it will have your data. So. I don't really have answers, sorry. I, 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 wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind hearing from a representative from big evil capitalism. Um, who's put up his hand. <laughs> um, up front here, there's a microphone coming your way. Uh, Hugh Simons from Insurance Australia Group. And you'll turn over. Thank you. Um, yes, so for context, we're an $18 billion publicly listed company, $11 billion in revenue. So yes, we're rather large. We collect. Uh, customer data are about four or five million Australians and a couple of million Kiwis. Um, 
Yes, there's a couple of things. So firstly, the good news. Um, the Productivity Commission report has basically said two things. Uh, one is that the data we collect from customers will be, in the future, near future, will be the customer's data. They will own that data, not us. And what that means is when you go to Commonwealth Bank to get a mortgage and you're with Westpac, you can authorise Westpac to release your data to Commonwealth Bank via a set of standard APIs. This is going live in the banking sector in July next year. So this is happening quite quickly and it's scaring a lot of people in the financial services industry because we're the first, um, first ones lined up to do this. Um, the um, second one is the Productivity Commission is basically uh, come up with a general statement around releasing data sets in the national interest. So corporations may be compelled by the government to release data sets that are deemed in national interest. Now we, just to give some context of what that might mean for say a large insurer, we've spent about, uh, like I'm guessing, probably 30 to 40 million dollars building what is clearly the best flood risk data set in Australia. Um, and we did a bit of open data with that a couple of years ago at GovHack, it scared a lot of people inside the company. That IP is worth tens of millions of dollars to us in competitive advantage against our competitors. So that is why it is not open data and it will never be open data in its, in its raw, detailed scientific form. Unless, of course, the government says this is in the national interest. Yeah. Um, if I could just grab one more minute around personally identifiable information. So the point about not using data uh, for a purpose for which it was not collected, that applies to personal information. It does not apply to general information, um, generally speaking. Um, how do we... How do we secure that data? Um, obviously, technology-wise, we're trying to do our best through our cybersecurity group and all that. We also did an audit. So two years ago, we did an audit on every single field and every single table and all 250-odd source systems, and we assigned a privacy rating to every single field. Some 20-something thousand fields, or so, I can't remember what it was, but and basically a privacy, you know, name and age is like one. Mm -hmm. um, something unrelated like it's something, you know, they drive a Toyota Corolla, that might be like level three, for example. And so that's how we govern the use of the data. So when someone says, I want to use the data for this, straight away we know what the privacy level of this data set is and we know what its acceptable uses are and what they aren't. It gets interesting when we start mixing data, when you start going through that accidental re-identification issue. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a big issue for us. We'd like to be more open. We have competitive pressures. We have regulatory pressures. Um, and then we obviously have the Privacy Act as well, which we have to honor. Thank you for that, Hugh. All right, um, I want to draw the uh, discussion now towards a, more towards the topic of diversity. Um, so we are now going to our second poll question. And uh, obviously when people talk about diversity, the first things that comes to mind is, is gender diversity, and that's very important. Um, but in your, on your poll, um, the question is, other than gender, what is the most important attribute where our community urgently needs more diversity? And there are your options. So we'll give you a couple minutes. We have eight results. We're not seeing any results yet. Here we go. Because I'm a stingy bastard, you know, there's only a hundred of you that get to vote, so vote early. Vote early, vote often. First past the post. Sounds like Wilson's the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> So I think people are saying we've got too many white Australians um, <laughs> in our community. Although I was at a f another couple of events in the last couple of weeks, sort of, sort of special, and we're not doing too badly in this particular community, I must say. Um, there was an event um, last week where I was one of the youngest people in the room. <laughs> Um, and I'm glad to see how I know we're probably in the top 10 percentile uh, age-wise in this particular community, which is good. Um, anyway, so um, ethnicity, maybe not that surprising. Geography, uh, top choice in this poll. Um, what do we think about that? Um, Hannah, maybe you, you want to comment on that, not being from Australia. Um, I think I've just known this now, but there are mapping communities in the Philippines where I grew up in, but it's not as widespread as 
or it's not as active as this because mm -hmm. I've never heard of it until I had to go to a mapathon that OpenStreetMap um, was doing for Typhoon Haiyan a few years back. So there were maps missing and they called um, for help. I think it would be interesting to see more of this mm -hmm. in countries where we are not as privileged. And I think it would be beneficial to a lot of communities, especially, for example, like coming from my background in the Philippines, we get typhoons a lot. And when these communities are hit, they just basically disappear. Um, and I don't think our government, well, some areas of the government now that I've spoken to actually use QGIS. So they've been trained to do mapping to identify areas which need more help. But I feel like it's not as widespread as it needs to be. So it has to be removed from the universities and be brought to you know, smaller like, villages or smaller groups that are actually on the ground who help out. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to vote for both B and C there. Um, but just to roll out some stats from this event, uh, over 30% of the people registered are not identifying as male, um, and nearly 20% of the people here are not from Australia, um, which, which is actually a, a lot more than a, th a, a lot more of a diverse audience than I thought we would get. And there is also, um, you know, people here that are maintaining core libraries in the open geospatial world, and then people from government. Um, people from large insurance companies, uh, people from large government organizations. It's, it's, this sort of community is something that, that is kind of leading the way in terms of, of trying to bring uh, a range of point of views into how geospatial things happen. Um, and yeah, like I agree with, um, with Maurice. I've been to other industry events and it's kind of like I can see 200 people here and they all look exactly like me and they all think exactly like me and, and I, I know that point of view. I don't want to hear it anymore. I want to hear from everybody else who isn't like me. So um, I think we're, we're on a pretty good path and we can try and, you know, we can always do better, I think, up, and we'll, we can keep pushing it as much as we can and it would be great to um, have an event like this someplace that's, that's not here so that... Um, it's a bit easier for us who live here and have money and can travel to go somewhere else than it is for a lot of people that have come here to get to here. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Sir? Uh, I don't have a, a lot to add, but I was just thinking if we want diversity, I guess it's about looking at how we uh, encourage people to participate, about being inclusive, putting the word out there. I mean, everybody here is a leader and can do a part of that. So I guess it's just about keeping the community um, working together and, and recognising it. I mean, I've been to a lot of um, spatial forums where, like, the women's group have their thing at the lunchtime mm -hmm. in the back room. <laughs> um, so the fact that we're having a conversation in the plenary um, is a good thing. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Any, any comments from the room? Martin again? I just wanted to ask whoever in the know that's following on a tweet from, I think a retweet from Alex from a few months ago uh, after an event uh, in, in Queensland. Someone, uh, a female participant, was commenting that after having moved from environmental sciences to spatial, she was stricken by the fact how non-diverse our community is. Now, I, I think this may be partially because of our surveying roots, but I think this community already have very few of the surveying roots there. I'm wondering what, it could, what could be the reason that it's so different in ecology, environmental science, and so where is the gender parity is much closer uh, than, than here. Huh? Any, any ideas? What, what is the underlying structural failure? Is it, is it, um, uh, I wonder if we're different than tech. Like, I mean, I know that a lot of the tech conferences are doing are very good at uh, having diverse audiences, but I wonder the tech industry, do we know? So someone, um, uh, Lady Miello in the back. 
So it's Jane. Um, I would, uh, you know, from the viewpoint of ecologists, you know, I'd say that we do well at diversity at, at younger age groups, but we still, you know, there's there's the, that big sort of, as as you look for people in more senior positions, we have a lot of lack of diversity and a lot more men. Um, I, I would have guessed that for the, for this community, it's just because it's like the maths and stats sort of thing that 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 it's it's at school level. How do you appeal to students to want to code and to want to you know do stuff like this? You know, and I think that's gradually improving. But um, and and all those sort of like I know in R, all those sort of coding for girls and you know um, people getting opportunities to sort of see it as as a future are really valuable. Um, anyone else want to like to comment? Oh, there we go. Yeah, look on the diversity thing. I mean, if we're looking for a practical measure of what can be done, um, if we're going to make this sort of conference in this region a, a semi-regular thing, um, I know there was chat about revolving it between Australia and New Zealand, um, you know, maybe every couple of years or something, but there's no reason whatsoever that other regional communities in Oceania can't put up their hand and say, hey, we'd like to host one of these things. Um, you know, it, if it does become a regular sort of thing, there's no reason it can't be, you know, sort of Australia, New Zealand, another regional location and just keep doing a cycle like that, you know, to, to help get that diversity within our region um, being invested in and, and contributing um, to the community. All right, thank you for that. Um, at the front here. Um, this might be an alternative perspective, but um, it seems to me the rest of the community outside technology is vastly networked and much more open, which causes our politicians and other people some bother, but much more open. And there's a lot of good research coming through is that like open source practices in software, in fact, lots of comparisons, um, that that is a much more rapid exchange of information than our traditional 30-year education cycle. So it might be worth us networking expertly. All right, thank you. Um, I think we're going to have time for one more uh, poll question. Um, this one's an open question, so you may have to think and type words rather than make a choice. Um, yeah? Um, and it's about to come onto the screen. Right here we are. What are the key risks we expose ourselves to by not having enough diversity in our mapping projects or community? Um, Just keep in mind with these, if you type a phrase, it'll pull out the words and split them up and it'll use the individual words. So it's yeah, so try and pick a single word. Keywords. Oh. Or if you have multiple, maybe combine them with an underscore. So what do we miss out on, or what, what, what are the dangers if we don't do it? Wow. Well, the number, the number goes up. Who wrote potato? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for that. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing buyers, obviously, um, but another one, uh, big ones are groupthink, irrelevance. The last little bit is to pick words that are up there already and um, <laughs> engage in groupthink. <laughs> <laughs> And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how you manipulate elections. 
I, I think we should change that message to Bill. The, the poll is full of idiots. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, um, all, all of that aside, um, one way of interpreting this, I think, is that the risks are numerous and endless. Um, but so, Leander, you had your hand up. You wanted to comment something on the outcomes. What happened to a microphone? Um, when I see a lot of um, emphasis on getting more women in tech, they always talk about, okay, getting kids, the young girls, into the maths and science and, and things like that. I'm wondering also if we're not missing a resource in the people of my generation, I'm pushing 50 and older, who are coming back from, you know, having kids working in admin roles who are actually very quite bright. I don't think you need necessarily to have that sort of background to use a GIS system. And I've, you know, I've seen many... There are a lot of people who don't have that sort of background who they just do that. And that's the way in the 80s and 90s a lot of um, computer science people came in. <laughs> Sorry. Is they were just <laughs> hobbyists. They just grabbed these Commodore 64s mm. and started playing and they were working in something mm. completely different. I think there's, there's an opportunity there for that generation. Mm. I mean, I came through computer science because I had a feminist mother, but I think th there is a big untapped resource out there and OpenGIS is a tool that we can put on their desktop and they can start playing with. Okay. Uh, can I just add to that? Um, in, the, in the four of the five workplaces that I've worked in in the last few years, um, it, the gender balance has been actually more on the, the female side than the male side, um, which I think is really great. Um, but... Oh, what else was I going to say? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just keep on with that one. Yeah, so it hasn't been my experience that it's been such a, a male-dominated area. Oh, th this was the other thing. Um, in, in, I guess, the, w the workplace that I enjoyed working in the most, um, out of the staff of 35, two were um, GIS accredited or had formal training. Um, one was the boss, and he'd gone and done a master's in GIS. And one of the other guys uh, who was... his degree was in mathematics, had also done a, a postgraduate in GIS. Everybody else was an ecologist or a, a surveyor or um, there was such a diverse range of backgrounds. Um, yeah. Henry, just here in front, sorry. Hi, yeah, um, look, um, kind of a slight tangent, but uh, I teach programming for a living for professional development, uh, which is great fun, but um, one thing I will completely agree with you, we are absolutely missing more older women coming back into the workforce. I do teach older women and they are absolutely as capable as anyone else I get in my classes. So please, if you do encounter people like that, please encourage them to get back involved. There is no reason you can't do this stuff. Okay, uh, Mel, Neil and then the gentleman in the back. And then we probably have to start winding up. Thanks. I think uh, one of the things that um, the lack of diversity is probably skills coming mm -hmm. in, so more designers and storytellers and people who are not necessarily technical coming into this community as someone who is non-technical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, and I think the other thing is really around collaboration as well. So um, Jesse Cato, who was here from Publish What You Pay, is there, we're out there trying to make sense of a lot of data um, and we need some help and we would love to be collaborating with some people because we have some real needs. So I'll just put that out there in terms of diversity of storytelling. Yeah, I think diversity is something that we shouldn't really beat ourselves up about because these things evolve. You can't just make it happen. I mean, I couldn't, when I was signing up for this conference, I said, Neil, you've got to be more diverse. <laughs> well, okay, do I not sign or do I sign? <laughs> um, it, it, uh, when I studied engineering in the 1970s, there were no females studying engineering. So is it any surprise that the ranks of senior engineers today 
there'd be no 60-year-old engineers, mm -hmm. in, female engineers. Um, and, and that's not surprising. That's something that's got to evolve and it's a generational thing. But in this sort of an industry, which is a younger industry, um, I think there is the opportunity for the evolution to happen a lot faster mm -hmm. than some of the ancient professions. All right, the gentleman um, in the back in the blue shirt. Yeah, I think as well as the you know, discussion about um, diversity of you know, who, who's involved in the community, there's also something to be said about um, you know, diversity for the, uh, for the pr practitioner themselves uh, and the experience that they draw on to be able to, um, how do you say it, I guess maximise you know, the opportunity uh, that we're presented with, with uh, working with um, both the, 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 the applications and, and the software. And uh, so, you know, as well as, you know, meeting as a community to talk about, you know, the, the down in the weeds of, of the technical aspects, I think it's also important to sort of lift it up a little bit and think a bit more broadly about, you know, how, how we, uh, we benefit the, the end users of our, of our work, which are the people that are making decisions based on the evidence that we, uh, uh, we produce in our work. Um, and so, you know, bringing the allied professions in uh, to the conversation, I think, is going to be uh, really important as well. Thank you. That, that, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I've got the sense we could easily go on for another hour, and I suggest we, we potentially do that over dinner. What I would like to do now is give our panelists an opportunity to uh, maybe make some final observations um, and say if you've learned anything from the last hour and 20 minutes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just to summarise, I'm just going to summarise by saying, well, what do I take away and how do I help the community from here on? Um, so one of the things is around open data and making sure that we're getting our voices heard um, to that Office of National Data Custodian, because I think that is really critical. Um, and then the other one is around diversity. So I recently um, was part of the Academic Women in Leadership uh, course at the University of Melbourne. And through that, I sort of learned that while I'm a product of uh, going through an engineering degree and um, I need to help others and to, to change what I see as diversity, um, so I'm involved actively in mentoring other women and helping the community to um, expand diversity. So those are the two things that I'm going to take away and hopefully help with. Thank you. Adam. Um, I, I personally love that our greatest risk is potato. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> um, you know, how many technical conferences do you ever go to where we just take the piss out of ourselves like that? Um, I think this is the only one that I've ever seen something like that happen, um, this community in general. Um, and I just, um, on the topic of diversity, there was an interesting paper came out just a couple of weeks ago about um, how role models that look like you are a big influence on whether you stay in a community or not, and, or stay in a community of practice. And um, I think that's, that's super important because there's a lot of discussion in uh, even in OSDO circles around are uh, women quit or different people of different backgrounds quit because they're not interested and um, I don't think that's true at all I think it's because people just have different life paths and then uh, have more difficulty re-engaging at, at different stages of career like how do you re-engage if you have had kids and haven't worked or been a, a full-time mum for five years and in the current job market you can come back and be super skilled and employers will just go, oh, you know, they, we'll, how can we employ you again? So it's, it's a huge barrier to overcome. And I think, yeah, there are sometimes practical reasons why there are not senior figures from different backgrounds, but a lot of the time it's just because there are literally, like, ceilings that they can't get past or ceilings that... Are, there are more barriers in life than, than other people. Um, but I think this community has, like, a real opportunity and it's been working on that. We can see that here and in, in other conferences that I've been to in the same community to drag people along, like bring people along for the ride. And um, as well as say, hey, you know, anyone can come along. Say specifically, we want you to come along. And we're giving you the tools and the opportunities to do that by um, not having a financial barrier to using tools or having this community of, of people that are just willing to help out. So, um, yeah, going forward from here, I think, you know, we're, we're on a pretty good path, I think, and um, I'd love to see how it evolves in the future, and let's um, see what happens. Anna? Um, I think I would like to end this by saying thank you 
to not only the ones who um, contribute to open source, but to everyone who use it as well, and everyone who takes the time out to reply to people on Twitter, to reply to questions on wherever platform questions come in from, because this gives the wider world an, a better impression of what we are as a community. Um, there's this misconception that if you use open source, usually you don't get the help that you need, like you're on your own, figure things out. But what they're missing out is that we might not have the traditional phone number <laughs> that you can call or you can email, but you know, shoot out, an e shoot out a tweet or you know, go to one of the Slack channels and just put up I do that a lot. I put up stupid questions. And like two seconds after, somebody comes back to you and says, why don't you try this? So I think um, each of us can be an empowering force for like, people like me who at first were intimidated. So I think this is a step forward. Like, be that person who's willing to spend two minutes to reply to someone who asks questions about whatever you're good at. And I think that's going to improve um, our community moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists for their input today. And, and, and for myself, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your input and contribution and making this a very successful and engaging session. Thank you for staying till the end, and, and I wish you all uh, much pleasure and further conversation during our dinner tonight. Thank you. And, and thank you, Maurice.